being recorded. Ah, here we go. Right. Okay. Fine. Um, well timed. Thanks for attending our latest MedTech Forum webinar this evening, dealing with, I guess, what <laughs> anyone would think is quite a vexatious subject of how to engage with the NHS. To set the scene, it's worth reflecting that the NHS has a budget of, uh, uh, I think, around £110 billion, maybe more now with COVID, and around 1.1 million employees, making it the world's fifth largest employer. It's not only large, but complex too. So any SMEs looking to sell their products or services may need to consider their different approaches and access to, in NHS England alone, around 100 clinical commissioning groups, although they continue to merge, and around 200 acute hospital trusts. Primary care is delivered across the UK <clears throat> by over 8,000 general practices. And if you happen to be in dental products, as did myself at one time, around 12,000 dental practices. So it's quite a challenge just in marketing and distribution. <clears throat> Before the products even launched, it's imperative to understand the unmet clinical need, how to gather the supporting clinical evidence, the regulatory issues, how to establish clinical trials, importantly, who's going to pay, and a myriad of other questions. So having managed two medical device businesses myself and been a mentor on the NHS Clinical Entrepreneur Programme, I guess I'm familiar with the challenges innovators face in engaging with and gaining market access to the NHS. I mean, both innovators already working in the NHS and businesses wishing to launch new products or services. So I'm pleased to welcome our presenters this evening who will try to make sense of all this, but coming from differing viewpoints. So from the local EAHSN, Eastern Academic Health Science Network, Louise, Louise Joplin and Alex Lloyd, from businesses that are selling into the NHS, Bridget Bard of Bioshore and John Simpson of Neuropad, and from academia, Beverly Vaughan of Anglia Ruskin University. And we, we, we weren't successful in getting someone to represent an NHS trust per se, and I, I guess because they're kind of busy at the moment, but we have made some very useful contacts for future events. So I would ask if each presenter could endeavour to keep to around 10 minutes, although we may have a little bit more time, each presenter, uh, which will leave plenty of opportunity for questions at the end that can be placed via the chat and QA boxes. So now I think it's over to Louise uh, for the first presentation. Great, thank you. And I'll just... So could the host enable me to share my screen, please. Okay. That should work now. <laughs> Perfect, thank you very much. There we go, one second, and I'll get that on slideshow. Um, so hopefully Alex will be able to join us, but I just thought I would give a, a an overview of what um, we do within the academic health science networks and particularly in the east of England. So that's um, the organization I represent, um, Eastern AHSN and how um, we support medtech and digital SMEs in particular. That was the theme of this particular meeting, but actually SMEs across the spectrum to um, access the NHS. Um, so, a couple of slides, the, the broad remit of the AHSNs. Um, we are funded by the NHS, NHS England, an improvement, and the Office for Life Sciences. Um, we are mandated to accelerate the uptake, adoption, and spread of innovation within our health and care systems, and to create economic growth for our particular regions. And really it's the overarching vision. So the AHSNs were set up in 2013 um, as a recognition of the NHS wasn't particularly speedy at getting innovation adopted um, and looking at other mechanisms to enable that. So really the vision is for um, the NHS to be that global leader in the uptake of innovation um, and to support the more rapid 
adoption and spread. So not just testing it in a single center and then my patients are different to yours just down the road, um, having disabling the barriers or um, lowering those barriers to the adoption and spread. And so how, we're, how we are structured, so this covers England, there are 15 AHSNs geographically located. Um, as I mentioned, Eastern, we cover the whole of the East of England, so particularly the corridor that, that you guys all represent. Um, and we are, why we are geographically clustered is, to your point right at the start, Bill, is that the NHS is very fragmented, it's constantly changing, there's new acronyms and it's being packaged up in, in slightly different ways um, in the next uh, iteration. Um, but it's by truly understanding and embedding within that local health and care um, system within our region that we can understand what those needs are and best match those with the innovators that, um, that we come across. So we broker between NHS and industry. Um, and it's really about being collaborative. So it's not just about saying we're only interested in what goes on in the east of England. It's actually what works in our region. We want to scale that very, very quickly across other AHSNs and ultimately lead to national programmes that are then rolled out and cascaded across the whole of England. So how do we do it in the east of England and, and any of the AHSNs or the other 14 will have some similar pillars, but by bringing together the relevant parties involved within our local health and care system, right at the heart of that are the citizens the citizens, the patient population. So we really do um, embody that with um, a number of the panel meetings, multidisciplinary teams that we have at Eastern AHSN, with the universities in our region, the health services, and obviously the industry. Um, we then, you know, you can only um, demonstrate a good idea by actually putting it into practice. So part of the skill set and the network that we as the AHSNs work with, we leverage, is to help that SME make that next step to really uh, pressure test their system in, in the health and care um, context. And then deliver. We, um, about 50% of our resource and our finance is spent on um, helping um, test and validate what we call local programs, those SMEs we come across. And I've got a case study in one of my subsequent slides um, to generate their real world validation within our region. But we also, um, for the remainder of our uh, resources, we, um, we roll out and cascade national NHS England programs. And the most recent are around um, uh, eating disorders, and ADHD um, and the team are delivering uh, an awful lot of work around cardiovascular disease and particularly asthma and increasing the access or finding uh, decreasing the barriers to increasing access for asthma patients to early detection of their disease and exacerbations in primary care but also access to high cost medicines in secondary care. We know that this journey for innovators is rarely, if at all, linear or a step-by-step -step consequential. So we tried to sort of depict it. We know that it's an iterative process. And at any point on this journey, we within the AHSN can, can support. I don't have an army of IP lawyers before anybody asks, but we work, obviously, any innovation coming from uh, universities that IP is usually uh, dealt with through their tech transfer office, but uh, we have uh, contacts in our in our network that can do that. Finance can be grants or um, brokering with some of the um, investment groups that we work with, um, and I'll commercial uh, sorry clinical trials and evaluation. That I would say is probably the one of the, the key elements that we do. But, but in order to help an innovator get to a point where they're ready for a clinical trial, we really hold their hand to build their value proposition. Um, is it a true unmet need? And we'll really pressure test, we'll help with pitch pre, pre, oh, excuse me, pitch preparation, all of those kinds of things as well. 
some of the uh, events that we run. So very much for the SMEs, the insights to impact masterclasses can be around particular themes such as digital reimbursement, procurement, regulatory frameworks. Um, for, we also run the Scale Up Academy uh, with another company called Cartesia when companies are at a particular pivot point, they've had their first first sales and they're really looking to, to bridge that and get that meet that inflection point to the next stage of their commercialization. Um, support for the clinicians in our region, and those may already be part of the National Clinical Entrepreneur Programme, but they may be those aspiring to join that. They might not have the confidence, they think, mm, it's just my idea, or no one will be interested. We give them that confidence, and I've got some real examples of that. And then um, right in the middle here, we have our inspiration or our innovation exchange events. That is very much where the system comes to us or organizations such as Macmillan Cancer um, come to us and say, here are our um, health or clinical challenges at the moment. Do you have innovations that you can vouch for? And we can then start matching those. Um, and we've got some really great examples of programs we've taken forward uh, from last year. There's a raft of online resources that we've got on our website. So for any innovators, these are freely available. Many have templates within them so that you can start building your own business case, develop your um, value proposition, how to engage with patients right at the very start. I can't emphasize that enough, um, all the way through to market access and procurement and everything in between. And this example here is, is just to give you a flavor of probably within about a six month period actually of meeting um, a professor at Cambridge University Hospitals, Professor Havorka, who had developed um, this uh, algorithm for type one diabetic um, individuals. And this algorithm worked in real time with a, a continuous glucose monitor and an insulin pump. And um, the, so the, it, it's described as an artificial pancreas. In essence, the uh, technology came through to our multidisciplinary team, our innovation review panel, um, and was, was highly regarded. It really met a lot of the unmet needs and the high clinical strategic areas within the east of England. And as Eastern AHSM, we worked with CAMDIAB, the organization, to develop a health economic evaluation, develop an infographic. So it was easy bite-sized information, communicating that to clinicians, um, financial teams within NHS trusts. We developed a market access plan. Um, we ran various workshops where we could get into the technology, developed a business case, and then brokered those procurement framework discussions within um, various parties within NHS supply chain. So a, a lot of components there, um, and I can go into more detail afterwards. And my final slide really is, is this is the collective work of all 15 AHSNs. Um, just last financial year, the numbers of companies across the whole network that were um, supported um, and for that economic growth, uh, metrics, those, those three at the bottom, the investment leveraged by those organisations, the jobs created and the jobs safeguarded. Um, and that's a year on year growth that we, we have seen across the network. And then my final slide is really just um, to say if any innovators want to get in touch, there's an email address there, obviously the usual channels. Um, and if anybody's interested in working within the organization uh, follow the bottom link and um, see if there's any any roles that are of interest so i'll pause there <laughs> fine thank you very much that, yeah that, that's great and, and, and beautifully on time thank you very much um i, th I think we should are there any urgent questions right now or, or can they wait until the uh, the end of the session do you think no okay uh, I think next up is uh, is Bridget Bard. Uh, would you like to start your presentation, Bridget? Oh, 
There she is. Oh, uh, now I've muted. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, I've got headphones on. I've dashed home to work <laughs> at home rather than the office. Right. <laughs> Share screen. There you go. There you go. Thank you. Sorry, two seconds. What's it I've got lots of screens, have you? <laughs> yeah, and I'm not on my desk. Either. Lots of screen. <laughs> Can you see that? No, I don't. Not, not yet. Oh, not at right. the moment. Have another go. Okay, let's try that. I'm sorry, you can oh, see go. the yes. Looking good. Can, right, you can you see go. the BioSure screen. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Sorry about the, the uh, technical <laughs> issues there, everyone. Don't worry, do mitis. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, no, you think I'd be experienced by now, really. <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me um, to speak today. I'll just speak briefly about Bioshore. Um, we're an Essex based SME, um, been around since 2011. Uh, we're actually a diagnostics manufacturer and we have specialised in self testing. So our claim to fame really is that we developed and launched the world's first HIV, blood-based HIV self-test, yeah. which is very consumer facing. Um, at the time, it was the highest risk medical device that's ever come to market. Um, and to gain our CE marking, we had to evidence that untrained users could perform their own test get their own result, read their own result, and then act appropriately. So it's, it, we've, we've had a very high bar um, to work with. And uh, we now are about to launch our COVID-19 antibody self-test, which will actually tell you if you've had an immune response either to recovery from infection or from having um, an immune response to the vaccine. So we specialise in, in high, um, high risk testing, you could say. Um, we also are distributors for other manufacturers, and that was really our path into um, the NHS, which I know we're here to talk about today. So, um, yeah, if we can just, uh, I can click onto that one, hopefully that will change. Um, yeah, so about our journey, really, with um, the NHS, and it was interesting to hear Louise talk about the various routes for supply. So we um, got onto an NHS supply chain framework agreement in 2013 with quite a wide range of products, about 10 different point of care tests. And we thought, wow, fantastic. You know, we've, we've cracked it. Let's bring in loads of stock. Let's manufacture. And the framework agreement went live and we didn't get a single order. And it's like, oh, my goodness, <laughs> we thought this was a route into the NHS. And we realised at that point that there was an awful lot of legwork for us to do um, to generate sales. It wasn't just a given that we were on this framework agreement with, you know, tens of thousands of products, probably, and how we would um, raise our head really above the parapet and get, get the, you know, the trust knowing that we existed and also what we had to offer. So I was thinking today when I was thinking about the presentation tonight about how we actually started that. And I think we started with, with Google um, searching. So uh, we, we kind of fine lined that and fine tuned that down to where we thought we had the biggest target market where we could generate the most revenue. Um, and then we just kind of hit the phones, hit the email, um, got meetings with, with people, still didn't really understand the full process of how we would supply those people. And as I say, we're, we're high risk products and we've specialized until COVID in sexual health. But we now work with trusts across the UK, but our first trust that we really did um, target was CNWL, so Central and North West London, which carries the highest uh, footfall for sexual health clinics. And we had to go through um, a clinical evaluation. They didn't, you know, just take for granted because we were on supply chain that we would be able to just, you know, supply them with product. Um, and over a period of about 12 months, so our pipeline for supply into any new trust is six to 12 months um, within the NHS. Um, and once we had that approval, then we went to the next trust using the following postcode, 
And they said, oh, no, we don't share that, that information. That's, um, yeah, that's, you know, that they're different from us. And so we had to do it all again. So it is very complex and it's really hard work. Um, what I would say is that during that process, you generally get to build quite strong personal relationships with people. And for us, it was quite straightforward that we had a lot of unique selling points in what we were doing, but we definitely had to educate clinicians um, around those points. And we had to convince them that, uh, you know, this was the right product for them and why that was. And we had to convince them also to do a clinical evaluation. So, um, but once you're in, it's a very high bar to get through, but you generally do have, obviously other competitor products have the same um, level of scrutiny to go through in the same process. Um, so don't lose heart, but do be prepared that it could be a 12 month pipeline before you actually supply. Um, the other thing that we found is that we needed to become the clinician's friends. So it was no point us kind of railing against the storm. Um, it was a point of um, educating them, understanding the gaps in our knowledge, because um, but the scrutiny is, is quite incredible. Um, but with having an early adopter, so when we were speaking to lots of different trusts, virtually all of them said, well, who is using your product? Um, and we really did need an early adopter. So the way that we convinced CNWL that we were really worth having a go with um, was that we wrote a protocol to come up with some pretty um, distinct and kind of trailblazer data. Um, and we did that work with them and got published in the BMJ. So once we'd achieved that, um, we then did have a case, and, and as you were saying, Louise, about having these case studies about what we could do and what the data said from a clinician's perspective. Um, to, to give you some heart, supplying in, or we've found that supplying into the NHS is definitely not all about price. So it's not you've got to have the cheapest product, you have got to have the best product for that situation. So it might be that you have got to, um, you know, you have you have a better delivery system or that you can have a more effective um, workflow within a place or and actually patient journey is also a consideration. So all of those points are things to think about um, and engage with. Um, it's also helpful if you can understand how your product relates in a clinical environment to demonstrate how that cost saving of a product, which obviously everyone's on finite budgets. So if you're saying a test costs X, they'll say, well, a thousand X is gonna be this much. So for us demonstrating how we can, how we can uh, deliver workflow efficiencies so that there is a cost effective solution is also quite convincing. Um, and we've also had to provide training and that's been refined, especially during um, the COVID era. So we've got train the trainer packages, which are very slick to deliver. Uh, we send out samples to everyone so everyone can perform their own test online or understand how things look and feel rather than trying to deliver, obviously with us uh, being in diagnostics. Um, that, that's, that's quite straightforward. If you've got a piece of equipment, that might not be so straightforward, but thinking about slick, time efficient delivery of training is also another consideration because the clinics literally have no time um, to spare for those, those types of things. And we've also, um, with the importance of marketing and making sure that you are always relevant to the buyers and to the people in the clinics, we have really um, proactively tried to collect data. So post-market surveillance data within those particular fields, which we share with the clinics, um, we share with Public Health England so that we can get feedback and keep reinforcing our credibility and a reason to stay as a customer. Um, the last thing, I'm not sure where the time is because I should have had a look at this, but, <laughs> but as an SME, and it is very much in our ethos um, at Bioshore, we have tried to always collaborate with other companies. So um, for us, looking at sexual health, our obvious low hanging fruit were with um, other condom, either manufacturers or suppliers. And we've actually got some really good partners, um, some external to um, the NHS, 
um, who are on supply chain and other agreements. And um, so we can collaborate in how we approach these customers and we have an even more relevant product offering. Um, but we also um, work with a part of the NHS called Freedoms and they are actually the largest distributor into the NHS of condoms. So we can piggyback on that and again, build the relationships. Um, but I would say, Keep heart, it does take a long time. The other thing to factor in is that cash flow, uh, we generally, you know, get, we do always get paid, I have to say, but sometimes we work on, you know, 30 days from the end of the following month. So things can can drag out. Right. But um, yeah, if, if, you, if you focus on the key trust where you think you can have the most impact, um, hopefully then other trusts will, will, you know, follow suit and then um, be slightly easier wins. So, okay. <laughs> thank you. Oh, sounds quite, that, that, that does sound like a challenge, that's for sure. Um, okay, thank you for that. Um, and uh, I think that shows uh, beautifully how much effort and time you sometimes have to put into just uh, getting in, getting in there. But once you're in, uh, then, then they're a great opportunity. Mm. So, yes. okay, now then, uh, John, John Simpson from Neuropad to uh, to relate his experiences with the NHS. Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. It's now some nice and loud and clear. Uh, um, uh, loudish. Loudish. How about that? Is that better? That's better. Right. So I don't have any slides. Okay. I've, I've no done to death with slides. I've, I've just <laughs> been, I've been. I'm on an accelerator program in in um, California and I have had so many meetings it's been like torture going over pitch after pitch after pitch it's driven me nuts um, so I refuse to do any more PowerPoint at the moment so I've, I've written a little story because I'm incapable of um, doing a presentation that would last 10 minutes without doing this because it would go on for about five hours um, this is this is a long story, um, and I've tried to shorten it. So shall to I start now? To, 12, to around ten to twelve minutes. Yeah, well, it, <laughs> right. exactly. That's what I've done. Um, so okay. So I'm going to start with a quote, an unusual one. It's uh, Millwall Football Club's club chant, which is, "We are Millwall, Super Millwall. No one likes us. No one likes us. No one likes us." we don't care. So instead of Millwall, substitute the word medtech. Actually, as SMEs, we do care quite a lot about how organisations perceive our innovative products. Millwall's chant is a metaphor for my company's experience in attempting to get the NHS and various health quangos to understand and appreciate the many advantages in the early detection of diabetic foot disease using our novel but well-evidenced home screening test. Our goal is to reduce diabetes related ulcers and amputations, which are devastating for many thousands of patients and their loved ones and cost NHS England a staggering 1.1 billion a year to treat. Diabetes UK say that 80% of these ulcers and amputations are preventable. We believe we know how to do that. Our test is unique. It looks like this. It's not the most complex looking thing, is it? but we have 40 clinical studies behind that. It takes 10 minutes to do. It's objective, has high sensitivity and 100% reproducibility, and it detects problems early when they can actually be treated. Current tests, such as the 10 gram monofilament, which looks like that. It looks like a sort of developed decades ago by two psychologists. Uh, it detects, our test detects problems early when they can actually be treated. Current tests, such as the 10 gram monofilament, which is a test for lack of sensation in the feet, detects late signs of disease, which cannot then be reversed. Diabetic foot disease has been referred to as a cancer equivalent, as following a foot ulcer, it has a five year mortality that's equivalent to non small cell lung cancer and a much higher uh, mortality than breast cancer. I can't stress enough that this is a really serious problem for people with diabetes and for the NHS. Ultimately, it's an unsustainable one. I'm an optimist. If you're entrepreneurial, you have to be. So I see opportunity in every difficulty, as Winston Churchill once said. The NHS and quangos such as NICE are, on the other hand, rather more pessimistic in outlook. And so they're inclined to perceive difficulty in every opportunity. 
This is not a great meeting point of minds, and trust me, it can lead to conflict. So here's what happened so far. To, here's what's happened so far to Neuropad within the UK health economy. This is my reality, and I'm not alone in this. Our journey started out quite well. Imagine my excitement and anticipation when in 2016, my company's product Neuropad was selected by the Medical Technologies Evaluation Programme for guidance development. I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting perhaps at best a technology appraisal. Just prior to that, Neuropad had also been shortlisted by the NHS Innovation Accelerator, otherwise known as the NIA, on the basis that it was, quote, a good patient-centered innovation that has the potential to improve screening for foot problems in people with diabetes and therefore reduce prevented, preventable foot ulceration and amputation, which are expensive for the NHS and devastating for patients. The panel that assessed Neuropad was chaired by Professor Sir Bruce Keogh, who at the time was NHS England's medical director and is ironically now a NED at NICE. And it also included representatives from 11 AHSNs. There were only 11 at the time. Obviously, now they're 15. It included the Health Foundation and patient representatives. The panel's final feedback was that Neuropad was, I quote, a simple, inexpensive product addressing a clear need that was supported by the panel and was, drumroll, a great innovation. I wasn't selected to become an NIA fellow as I informed the panel at the time that I didn't want to become one as I hadn't the spare time and that my application had been exclusively to get Neuropad accelerated by them. I had 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 at the time high expectations of the NIA. What followed may be best described as a tumbleweed moment. All my initial calm and then increasingly vociferous requests for support were ignored by the NIA. Still, there was always NICE, or as I now like to, think of it being the renamed the National Institute of Critical Economics and their technical evaluations which in reality are technical economic centers. Yes it's all about money. Patient benefits not a real priority. It's all about how much additional cost it adds to the NHS. Even if very substantial medium-term savings are deliverable its focus remains on the additional cost in the short term even if it's small. So NICE took an astonishing 108 weeks to develop and publish their Neuropad guidance on that. Two years. Towards the end of that process, we were invited to object to their proposed draft guidance if we wanted to. So naturally we did, as it was wrong. It's a process that they call resolution. It's like an appeal, but in reality, it isn't one at all. It's a tick box exercise that astonishingly is conducted by NICE themselves, sitting as both judge and jury. It's most certainly not an independent process. Despite us calling them out about numerous, numerous shortcomings and failings, including the appointment of an external scientific advisor with a major undeclared conflict of interest and not following their own internal processes, we were told in effect that there's nothing to see here. I believe that there is an urgent need for an independent NICE ombudsman to conduct appeals. The charity Diabetes UK also wrote to NICE as then CEO Sir Andrew Dillon in support of Neuropad screening. They were ignored. The APPG for diabetes, that's the all-party parliamentary group, by the way, um, also wrote to Sir Andrew Dillon, and they were also ignored. So were other charities and organisations and other clinicians, really senior clinicians. NICE doesn't appear to think that it's accountable to anyone, so it's very difficult to challenge its guidance. You feel completely powerless, and in fact, as an SME, you are. My guess is that they get bullied by the big companies, and so they then bully the SMEs. Well, that's my perception. We were told that the guidance would be reviewed in December 2021. Then along came the pandemic. So in April 2020, we formally wrote to NICE asking for it to consider an early guidance review on the basis that people with diabetes were having worse outcomes from COVID infection and were not attending clinics to have their feet examined to protect themselves. In addition, many clinics were closed. We also had important new evidence to present to them, published evidence that they actually asked for during the Medical Technologies Assessment Programme. That ought to have sprung them into action. NICE could have done a rapid review and issued a recommendation, even if it was only for during the pandemic, but it didn't. And it also took six months deciding that doing nothing was better than doing something. I personally believe that its failure to intervene when it could have done so last year is a de facto dereliction of duty. 
I'm sorry? Is a dereliction of duty um, and effectively discriminates against a large sector of British society. I told them this in writing last September. As a result, I've been accused of bullying them. That's right, me versus a 70 million pound per annum quango. No, I've not bullied them. I'm simply trying to get them to do the right thing for patients and for people with diabetes in particular. It's called being assertive and tenacious. Now we wait with some trepidation as the Neuropad guidance will hopefully now be reviewed in just over a month after a three year wait. So at least they brought it forward a bit. Hopefully it won't take them another 106 weeks this time. So what's my experience taught me? Firstly, nice can make perverse decisions. And so perhaps it's best to avoid nice altogether. Instead, you could consider taking your innovative med tech product to the USA first, get it FDA cleared, find a good partner there and raise plenty of money. You'll need it anyway. Only apply to the NHS Innovation Accelerator if you want to be an NIA fellow and have the spare time, otherwise launch in the USA. Did I mention launching the USA? I think I did. But I'm not leaving the NHS or Harlow Science Park in Essex where we're based. Being an optimist, I really hope that NICE will finally see sense in September. But our newly developed digital therapeutics apps, in one case, are going to the USA. And it will be years before we even consider launching one of them here. It's just too time consuming dealing with the NHS and related organisations. And Brexit, quite frankly, is making things even more complex for SMEs. All right, that's my rant over. Bill, back to you. <laughs> I, I guess that's yours disgustedly, Tunbridge Wells. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've been doing this since 2016 and it's taken a bit of a toll. This used to be dark brown. Um, well, there's a tale. Uh, I, I guess you're... Well, actually, Bill, that's actually the only part of it. I, I, I've condensed it. It's, I guess so it's, I understand. <laughs> it's, it's been utterly horrendous. I must admit, when I was involved as a trade advisor for UK Trade Investment, I would say to people, go to Canada, not the USA. But because I, I, I always found that Canadians culturally and every other way were more like us and the Canadian Standards Association was always more helpful. But there we are. Well, um, you know, it was actually easier to get it on the market in Brazil than it was, than it has been oh, here. Oh, if you, well, if you and, work with and, 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 Anvisa, and, then you're doing well. Yeah, and the Brazil regulator, Anvisa, is really difficult really yeah, difficult know, probably as difficult as the fda got that t-shirt um okay uh well thank you for that you you you're obviously seriously disappointed with the way things have been handled by nice and uh yes i, I think perseverance now but that's all you can do is to is to persevere and i i, I you, you mentioned about i i think patient groups are always important in these things and if you can get one of the one of the patient groups on your side it it, it can sometimes make a difference well, we, we, we did, Bill. We, Diabetes UK wrote yeah. a long letter on behalf of their Council of, of Healthcare Professionals, some really, really senior clinicians. Mm. They wrote in support of Neuropad and they were ignored. And Diabetes UK is, the, is one of the biggest charities in the UK sure. and it's certainly by far the biggest sure. diabetes charity. So we're going back to them. I've been in touch with Chris Askew, who's the CEO, to say, right, if you're serious about supporting people with diabetes go back to nice again before they they um issue the next review okay yeah well, good, well, good best wishes with that anyway thank you um okay uh now the the the, the, the viewpoint from academia beverly uh, from uh, anglia ruskin university over to you thank you very much i've just a couple of slides okay. um not very many I hope you'll all be hit, pleased to know. I hope you can see my slides on the screen. Yes, that's fine. Excellent. So um, good evening, everybody. I'm a face less familiar to all of you. I joined the Arise Innovation Hub team and Fiona, who is here this evening on the 28th of June. And I've been asked to talk about the academic perspective. But let me begin by telling you about the innovation hubs um, for those of you less familiar with them. So we are two innovation hubs located in Harlow and Chelmsford. And as John just indicated, John is one of our tenants in the Harlow site. And we're all about early stage entrepreneurs and businesses and really driving that knowledge exchange and engagement from that early stage academic idea through to building the companies, engaging with the patient groups, but then coming back in the other direction. Um, 
we are, as, as um, in the introduction, we are part of Anglia Ruskin University, which is a regional university um, which spans soon to be from Peterborough, Cambridge, Chelmsford. Um, so we ca carry quite a large geography across the east of England. And set in our strategic priorities uh, are looking at health performance, well-being, um, health performance and well-being. And these sort of drive our, much of our research, um, research interests and our medical research groups. So we have quite a strong background in health tech and med tech. So we want to do more than just support great blue sky and early stage research. We want to find a home for that research in the next stage. And we want those SMEs, startups and larger companies to benefit from the opportunity to work with our academics and for our academics and students to benefit from your learnings. Bridget, John, Louise, you've all shared some really excellent thoughts. Um, and it's about making that one complete circle. Let me just move on. You asked me to talk about how SMEs in the medtech and digital health tech, digital healthcare sectors access the NHS from an academic perspective. And I think the example I'd like to share with you here is something that was mentioned by Louise earlier on around the clinical entrepreneurship program and touches on points that everybody has raised this evening. So for those of you not familiar, our clinical entrepreneurship program led by Tony Young, OBE if I'm correct, um, began in 2016 as a vision to look at providing comprehensive and bespoke training commercial skills, knowledge exchange, and networks for clinical and non-clinical entrepreneurs in the NHS. So everything from your junior doctor through to your physiotherapist, through to your path lab um, scientist. If you've got an opportunity, a gap, an area of unmet need, how could this program allow you to develop that? We now fast forward to 2021, and you can see on this graph that we've got down on the bottom of the screen, we've gone from having 104 doctors enrolled in the program to over 194 new recruits who are now delivering, some of the older ones are now delivering training themselves. <clears throat> and they're not just across the NHS, we're now looking internationally. So there's a plan to work with some of the Australian universities and others indeed, because the NHS actually, if we want to talk about, um, you know, how can we um, look to ourselves outside of the United Kingdom? Well, actually the NHS is, is really a poster child for some of the things that make the UK great, not without its challenges, I completely understand that. So the Clinical Entrepreneurship Programme offers many things um, and this slide, which will be on the recording and I can make available, just goes through some of the things which do touch upon points um, raised by the AHSM programmes, um, points raised by lots of other um, networks, but what it brings together is for the clinicians that opportunity so they can come be part of the programme and actually find that enthusiasm and that shared learning, which I think Really, it's about creating networks. It's about creating knowledge that moves in all directions. It's not just about one route forward to commercialization. Often things need to take a step back. And it's hard to hear that, but if you're part of a supported network, then it makes it a lot easier. Some metrics about the Clinical Entrepreneur Program that really engages with our academics as well, not just in Anglia Ruskin, but much, much more widely than that, is that it's supporting, it's supporting jobs, it's supporting money coming into the NHS and these companies to actually really develop things. It's supporting clinicians returning to the NHS as a result of the program, which I think is a huge selling point. Um, and I think all of these things together with organizations like the AHSN, then looking at what's the economic case for this? What's, what's the next step for the outputs of these programs? Working with learnings from excellent companies like Bioshore to say, okay, we've, we've found the hole in the dam and we know what we need to do, but how are we actually going to learn from what other companies have learned in trying to deliver this? 
And I think this, you know, this is an example of an excellent program that engages that academic expertise, the clinical expertise, and the business expertise. Um, and so what's the academic perspective? That academics are hungry to learn. Academics are hungry to continue to develop. Um, I probably don't have time for a video, but my last slide um, was just to really focus on, you know, by developing these partnerships, continuing professional development, jobs, clinicians um, and non-clinical staff returning to the NHS. This is an example of how academia sits in the circle of this ring from that light bulb moment, what if we do this, through to actually delivering it at the other end. There's a role for academics within that. And at the Arise Hubs, I think it's a touch point that we can engage with and maximize the opportunity. So I think my point here is about the support of networks just like this and others to help everybody in making us better and to go forwards. And that's all I've got to say this evening. So I hope that's okay, everybody. I think you might be on mute, Bill. I have one more thing to say. Just a sec, got it. There we are. Um, yeah, th thank you, Beverly. So, um, hmm. well, uh, thanks also to all of the presenters. I think there's, um, we, we asked about different viewpoints, uh, and we've certainly got some different viewpoints uh, and experiences. Um, we've got a fair amount of time for some questions. I, if I could just take the privilege of asking, uh, asking one question. And I, I know Andrew Pacey is there. Andy, I've known for quite a, quite a long time. And Andy's got a great deal of experience in developing uh, medical devices. But what my interest with Andy is that you've also had experience in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, both in developing and manufacturing medical devices. So I think if I could suggest to Andy and, and to John um, uh, uh, and Bridget, if you were to, to say, what's the one biggest issue? What's the one thing that has caused you a load of angst about engaging with the NHS? Please, not another. <laughs> so uh, keep it fair, fairly tight. But Andy, do, do you want to start? Because uh, let, red, red type right. in the NHS and a total non-unified uh, approach. So right. you go to Ireland and the, the government is set up to try to encourage um, manufacturing and try to encourage money being generated and pulling in the corporates. You go to the NHS, you've got all this middle management tier who tick their boxes, and it, by the time you actually get anywhere near to it, most of the clinicians I've worked with have just sod, sod this, we'll go to Ireland and the US. Um, NHS Innovations in London, I was down there every month doing project review meetings on a project and every time we turned up it was a new group of project managers so 50 percent of the project was spent updating people that didn't have a clue about medical industry or medical devices just ticking their little box to say that their project plan's been filled in no hope whatsoever of getting a product to the market and the other one is ireland actually understands the regulatorial burdens. Um, we, nobody's mentioned the fact we've now got um, the MDR to cope with, we've now got the MHRA, mm -hmm. and we've got the UKCA fiasco as a, as a small company to get through. We, we're, I'm now the RA manager of a breast implant company, global breast implant company, and we are looking are probably not bothering with the UK because it's just not the return on the clinical requirements to meet the MHRA's requirement when we're selling Brazil, Mexico, everywhere around the world because it's not deemed to have a clinical or medical advantage apart from making you smile but um, they kind of don't class that as a, as a medical need. So I would say the NHS does not support real innovation in terms of product to turn it into a proper manufacturing global player. Okay, so 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 the one thing that 
that you find is a big problem if, above all else what so it's regulatory or is it yeah well biggest problem at the moment nh mhra don't understand what they're looking after okay. so it's, In terms it's of hurdles Hurd yeah it's hurdles okay. hurdles and regulations all right thanks so our speakers bidget what was the one big problem <laughs> Well, I, I've got, just before I say what I think our biggest problem is, first of all, I think we've got off quite lightly with listening to everyone else's um, <laughs> experiences. And Andy, I would so agree with the MHRA. We are warring with, have been since last summer on this new COVID test and bringing it to market. And similarly, UK is a big market for us, but the UKCA, um, I totally get the companies will not go through with UKCA marking. You, we definitely have a detrimental impact in this country um, with the UKCA marking. Um, but, I mean, I don't know if the NHS is utterly change resistant. I think it is just too complex. And the biggest hurdle we've come across is that people do not share information with each other they won't you know if, if you've got a clinical approval to be honest CE marking should be sufficient but you generally have to go through another layer but if you've gone through with a trust in one postcode it should definitely be relevant especially sure. if there's a similar population well, logically, you would have thought so. logically yeah and it, it doesn't so. happen and we've if been I dealing with the NHS yeah for seven or eight years now and it's not it's not changed okay okay John you're two pennies Oh God! Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, anyway, well, 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 it, the well, NHS, well. and this is before COVID, has always okay. been too busy firefighting, shoring up finances, shoring up waiting lists, stuff like that. It doesn't seem to embrace innovation. It talks about it. It sets up quangos. It sets up all these bodies to drive innovation. But the bottom line is, when you give them something that they can innovate, they don't like it. They honestly, there's nobody there to actually get hold of something and say, you know what, that actually does look like a good thing. We'll, we'll help you. We will actually help you. Go back to NICE. I've only been involved in, uh, with, with Neuropad since 2016 when we put it through to, um, to, to NICE's MTEP. I've actually literally, almost literally, outlived everybody in the MTEP department. And I've also, outlived um, Sir Andrew Dillon and Sir David, uh, what was his name, the uh, previous chairman. Um, anyway, so both the chairman and the chief executive and practically everybody else in the department is no longer there. There's just so, me left. So the, ch the churn of personnel doesn't help. Horrendous. Also, in my opinion, the best people leave. Mm. The best people get picked up to work as as game as uh, poachers um, yep. turned gamekeeper gamekeepers turned poachers. Yeah, we we had we worked initially with a very very bright person who was terribly enthusiastic, and she actually took the trouble of writing and saying that she thought that our product was one of the best medical devices that they actually looked at, and it had some some good evidence. And I've got my fingers crossed for you, and then promptly with went to to join a consultancy company and and after that it just went off a cliff but it went off a cliff really slowly for 106 weeks so okay it, it's like the worst form of falling off a cliff it just took, <laughs> you could see you could see the ground coming up it's very very slowly it's right. flat Anyway, we're now we've now got another opportunity because we're now coming up with the the next review, right. and I am not going to take any prisoners this time. I'm okay. going to make life a living hell for them if they don't uh, recommend it. All right. Uh, well, that well, I did ask, so there you are. Okay. It's a situation. You uh, uh, should we ask if anyone else in the meeting has questions uh, to to raise with uh, with the experts and with our presenters? I can't see anything on. Is there anything on the? I can't see anything on the. Perhaps all too shell shop uh, on the chat. Yeah, no. well, I've got my. I've got my hand up. It's right. Fiona here okay. from ARU. Right. So, right. Um, I, I would just like to um, attempt to spin this to the positive. Um, so I'd be really interested in um, um, Andrew and colleagues, uh, Bridget and John's uh, uh, view of what role um, something like the MedTech Forum can have in putting kind of capacity, expertise, muscle, influence, uh, et cetera, behind um, sort of uh, individual ideas. I mean, 
John and I have had a number of conversations about opportunities to do, I think, a little bit, um, as Bridget had suggested, going on a sort of trust by trust sort of basis and building coalition, um, coalitions of the willing, et cetera. But I just wondered um, uh, what, what, what individual reflections there might be on, on what role a network might have in uh, trying to address some of the challenges that we've heard this evening. Anyone? Yeah, oh yeah, I don't mind. I mean, I, I do, and I've always found this, I think the more collaborative approach that there can be, the better. Um, and one voice is, you know, is not very much on its own, but with some force behind it. Um, we definitely had to get clinicians on board. And John, we did, we did start on a trust by trust because it was, you know, hmm. the whole night, I, I literally, I think I didn't go down the route you've gone down. So I think I looked at their page on the website. I thought, bloody hell, I can't wait 18 months until we, <laughs> literally is what I thought. So it was on yeah. the phones and saying, right, can I take it out for coffee? You know, I really need to learn this. And I, I it might be an easier approach for you because you're raging against the machine and I'm just not sure you're you are saying in our company honestly and and Dave who's also kind of will know this we say if a door closes we climb through a window and we just have to find another way of doing it I can't I can't bear not it's like you but I, I wouldn't be spending my energy raging against it I'd find a different way get some data from the private sector find one hospital you can you know get some stuff across the line well, we're, we're being a bit, we're being a rather more radical than that, which is basically we've developed um, a digital therapeutics to go, to, a digital therapeutic app to go with this. So we can turn this from a categorical test, either have yeah. disease, don't have disease, into one where we have a desynchronous output. So we can continuously monitor patients. I'm taking that to the States. That's why I'm on yeah. the accelerator program in California. I'm raising several million dollars to move that there. Now, I'm not giving up here. I'm not moving from from Essex, from from Harlow um, just yet. I will. Nice will do the right thing. They will do the right thing because anything else is, frankly, completely unacceptable to patients with diabetes because there is no other test that anybody can do at home. You, you cannot do that in the comfort of your own home and diagnose whether you've got it's a clinical examination. Okay. You know, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It discriminates against people who have learning difficulties, cognitive impairment of all sorts of other types, hearing impairment, don't speak English as their first language. They can't respond to a, a subjective test. That's, this is entirely objective. Why on earth are they not recommending this? I don't think they've got anywhere to go. And the fact that they, they ignored me last year is, is completely unforgivable because that undoubtedly has caused misery um, and harm for thousands of patients. Okay. You, you obviously feel very passionately about that. To, yes. About this. To, to be fair, could, Louise, Alex, would you would you like to? Yeah, thanks what, what for that. Um, and I'll let um, Alex jump in as well. So, John, what I was going to say is, uh, well, and others, that uh, when I first joined Eastern um, two and a half years ago, some of the companies we were meeting, it was a case of, yeah, I'm not going to bother with the NHS US or the private healthcare markets or where I'm going to go first. And if the NHS sort of catches up with me, then fine. So, and this is where we're doing a lot of work as well with companies with an export and import as well, but that's another sort of element to what, what we do. I think just a couple of um, couple of things that I can, you know, I'd love to connect with you outside of this as well, John, but um, <clears throat> even just a couple of hours before this meeting, I was asked, right, we've got a community services provider. Um, there's a, about three different domains. One is learning disabilities, one is diabetes, what technologies do you know about? Have you got on your books? And and this is again where we the, this is the system coming to us, um, and we can be putting our you know those those technologies that are at that market ready stage to them. So that's one one bit. And then another piece just for the challenges that I've heard from from the innovators on on this call and many others. Um, but we recognise that um, and. We have ourselves have funded posts within our emerging integrated care system, so the ICSs, of which there are five across East of England, and 
particularly in Suffolk and North East Essex. I'm, I'm not bashful in, in shouting that one out, but we've got these, these other posts coming uh, forth in some of the other ICSs. But it's really to get that person within the system that has overarching, what are the strategic priorities of that system? And then we can be matching that. And, and actually the system itself, so SNE, have really seen the value of that to the point where they're now going to um, bridge that funding in year two and, and moving forward. But that's that for us as well, it was, enabling the pull from the system as well as the push from ourselves on behalf of the innovators and the innovators so there's a whole bunch of stuff there it's it's been that's been two years in in the making as as well so um i'm really quite appalled to hear about the 20 year uh, the last five years for you john um I, and yeah, I, well, I'll, I'll pause there, but um, I think there's there's a few things I could re very quickly try and enable for you. You might then tomorrow say, yeah, been there, done that, or don't want to do it. That's absolutely fine. But I think where we are, we've got a number of suggestions. So Alex, is there anything yeah. you can think um, of as well? Yeah, so um, like the majority of the people here, um, I've, until about, Two and a half years ago, I wasn't working for the NHS. So, Bridget, I, I've actually worked with you before. Until about two and a half years ago, I ran the private services at Superdrug, where we use a hell of a lot of your tests. Um, and we were really groundbreaking what we were trying to do there. Um, mm. and, and I've worked with a lot of people who tried to access the NHS. And, and I think one of my, one of my passions is, is finding uh, novel ways for people to access healthcare it's not always an NHS route. Sometimes it is a private route. However, I, I left that, that market because I recognised that there were ways to work with the NHS intelligently to enable access for people who can't go out and pay for the healthcare. Um, and um, and, and I, I agree with, with Lou, you know, um, John completely <laughs> empathise with 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 what you're you're talking about there, um, and uh, it, it's not always easy. I think sometimes it's about the point in the pathway you, uh, that you access. This isn't the first time I've heard of Neuropad. I, I knew it rang a bell. I just looked back at it, and I think I've looked at it once before. Um, it, it's it may be that you know we can we can support you. Um, it, it, in a way to try to start having conversations I don't know um, it, it's simply a case of can we can we start that conversation please um, and and it would be great to to understand a bit more um, there isn't always a way forward and it sometimes is a case that that people do find it easier to, to access and sell their their, their products outside of the NHS um, and, and I can't deny that however it, it would be great to, to at least open that dialogue with you um, and, and, and look at what we can do. Um, well, interest, interestingly, thank you very much for that, Alex. Um, interestingly enough, I approached Boots about um, three years ago, three or three years ago or so. Boots looked at it. They really liked it. What I didn't realise they did was that they took it to their... Um, head office to get it reviewed clinically and commercially. They took it to Dearborn in Michigan. So they took it to Walgreens HQ mm. and they wanted to do it globally. And they came back and asked me a very good question, which is, is it licensed in the United States? Well, that's, you don't license a med tech product like that in the States. It's, it's cleared by the FDA. You need clearance. It's not a hugely complex or expensive thing, but I had to go back and say, I'm really sorry, but it's not yet cleared because their response was, we think it's great. We'll take this on. We think it's a great product. I then went back to Boots and Boots astonishingly said, well, the problem is, John, we can't put it on the shelf because if we put it on the shelf, nobody will know what it is. So they won't ask for it. And we can't put it by behind the um, pharmacy outlet bit because patients won't ask for it. Now, I had a meeting at their head office in um, above on Bond Street. Yeah. 
is where the executive live. Yeah, I know. And I had this extraordinary conversation with their head of global head of innovation. And I said to him, I've just been to your store downstairs and this is what I think you should do. So here is, if you you don't mind. So this is a prescription bag. It's not, but you know, it's my little metaphor. And I said, this is a prescription bag, yes. And so somebody with diabetes goes to see the pharmacist and says, hello, my name's Mr. Simpson and I'd like my prescription for whatever. And they go, yes, I'll just find that. Now I said, how difficult would it be to clip a little notice about, have you had your foot checked? Would you be interested in our screening? Da, 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 or, or indeed inside the bag. And the extraordinary response was, oh no, we can't do that. And I said, why can't you do that? And he said, well, do you realize how much time that would take? And I said, what, just to clip something with a pair of staples? And he said, oh, well, if we add up all the stores in the UK and all the time, that's hundreds of thousands of pounds of cost. And I said, what about the millions of pounds of sales you might make? And he's kind of, oh, you know, I don't want to talk about that. That's the kind of attitude, because actually, you know, if you go back to your days at Superdrug, that's what they should have done. And in fact, I contacted Superdrug around about the same time and also Lloyd's and nobody even came back to me. No. John, have you, have you got CE marking as a self-test then? Yes. So you can sell OTC? Yes. Why don't you sell online? Well, we do. But not so enough. So you people. are revenue generating, but that's just marketing yes. though. It's, because it's, if you can prove <laughs> your case on, I mean, it's what we've done and we are in Superdrug and Boots and Lloyd's. We only started online and it's all about consumer marketing. So if you can say, look, I am selling 5,000 a week of these to end consumers, then Boots will listen to you. And you can pay 30 grand for them to put a leaflet in a bag or whatever else. And if you know you're going to generate revenue, then you can do those things. But you, you need, if you're already selling online and you can evidence how many you're selling, and that is a marketing issue, you'd be you'd be pretty wise to spend some money on marketing. Because um, <laughs> if you've got the regulatory approval and you can sell OTC now in the UK. Yeah, the class one IVD, we can, we've, got, we've even got published evidence, independent published evidence to show that patients can use this test at home. We'll buy some diabetics lists and, um, you know, digital market to <laughs> well, them. I told you, <laughs> if I may, you, you need to have a conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, apart, 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 apart. Yeah, I think guys I think, about marketing, which is my subject, but there we are. I think um, I need to have a conversation with several people. Could I, could I just ask one? This is probably more directed toward Beverly, but it's about innovations coming from uh, clinical entrepreneurs on the NHS clinical entrepreneur scheme. Uh, how much more difficult is it or easier is it to innovate from within than you've heard the problems of innovating from without? And I asked the question because... I, I, when I, when I was mentoring, I met a guy who was a computer software engineer who had then turned to medicine and had become a surgeon. And he recognized that there was a big problem in handing patients over from one department to another in the hospital. It was a big palaver and wasn't very efficient. So what he did, being a software engineer, he designed a software program. And it was brilliant. It, it, uh, it enabled a very fast handover from A&E to a ward or from a ward to an ITU. Fantastic. So he sold it to all his mates in the hospital and the hospital started using it. But then he faced the problem. How do I get other trusts to start to use it? So I just, <laughs> he seemed to be facing similar problems that folk who are outside the system get in terms of getting innovation adopted. Have you got any experience of that? Okay, so, I mean, with the Clinical Entrepreneurs Programme, it's still relatively new to Anglia, but from my experience in general and from what I've seen of the, 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 the uh, mentees coming through the programme, I think it helps to be within the NHS to, um, to really identify the opportunity or the gap. I think, you know, the problem. Um, and to think innovatively, you know, a lot of the clinical entrepreneurs, their app-based solutions, um, looking at the logistics challenges and, you know, everything from linguistic challenges that can be solved, you know, with the newer technologies that we have. I think 
the challenge that you're referring to, Bill, is very, very real. And that's where the point such as the CEP network comes into play and the business mentors that these clinically facing entrepreneurs are given, because we can't all be experts in everything. I mean, we can be jack of all trades, but we're not an expert in everything. And so Bridget's experience, for example, is not an experience that somebody within the NHS would ever have had from the other side. So I think there's always a point at which the network has to step in and you have to provide that next bit of expertise that's needed. Um, and it may be that many of the clinic, clinical entrepreneurs, you know, will get their products to a certain point and then it's somebody else's journey to complete. And that's where the value of the network is. Okay, that's, a, that, that's interesting. Uh, are there any more points, questions, grumbles, whatever that you'd like to, uh, like to raise during the meeting? No? <laughs> all got it off no, I, no i'd like to say oh, okay. thank you and I'd, I'd just like to say thank you and i'll definitely be connecting um Good. yeah off, offline and alex i'm sorry i didn't recognize you <laughs> Well. Uh, it, it was a member of my team actually who 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 dealt with you so yeah um i just i just when i saw the name i thought i know that name. why do i know it yeah and then you started chatting yeah 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 could i could i make a plea for you to keep us posted on developments because clearly there's a lot going on here with uh and it shows the value of these meetings where people can interchange views and maybe start to work together to solve some of their problems but um should, should we round it up now dave do you think Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Bill. I just also want to thank everyone online and, and our, especially our presenters. Um, uh, we, we had a few uh, fewer people than I imagined, but we're recording this. Um, I think that um, there's, there's lots of people out there that can benefit from all of this. And we're going to put the recording online so that people that missed the, the live performance can, can watch it and then hopefully come back to you with, with questions and, and, and contacts on, on how to get, uh, get further in this. So thank you to all of you. Yes, thank, thanks from me. Thanks to all the presenters, and thanks for thanks for coming along this evening. Right, goodbye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.